Hi everyone and welcome to my channel called Zuzana Reacts where I learn all things Parad with your help and I just share my Slovak Central European point of view. Now in today's video we're going to look into how Tata conquered British brands. We've talked about Tata uh, before but it seems to be a bit more juicy video uh, but before we get into that please like this video and click on the subscribe button and turn on the notification. Thank you so much for your support. Right, let us begin. I did not preview the video. I'm just hoping this is juicy and builds on my existing knowledge and uh, we can learn something new together today. Let's kick this party. Every major country has a brand that's synonymous with its national identity. In India, it's Tata Group. Tata Group, India's largest conglomerate. Tata Group has officially taken over Air India today. The 155-year-old conglomerate is India's leader in consumer goods, IT, steel, and automobiles. And for most of their history, they've focused on the Indian consumer. That means hiring Indians, selling them products, and sponsoring the local cricket league. But their enormous success has increased their ambition and led them to expand their sites internationally. And their strategy has been to buy iconic brands from a different country, India's former colonial rulers, the British. Imagine what the Indians must have felt like on that day. In 2008, Tata Group acquired two iconic car brands, Jaguar and Land Rover. But that wasn't the first time that India's largest conglomerate had added an iconic British brand to its portfolio. By the way, we have Jerlar in Slovakia. I think I mentioned it in one of my, our videos. It's um, it's a really huge, huge plan. It feels like a city, to be honest. In this video, we'll break down the brands that Tata has taken over, the success that they've found post-acquisition, and the other Indian companies following in their footsteps. But first, we need to talk macroeconomics. India's economy has grown substantially faster than the British economy over the last 30 years. Over the last three decades, Indian gross domestic product has grown by an average of 6.4% every single year. But during that same period, British GDP has grown by just 2.1%, and they've been forced to pivot their economy away from manufacturing towards services. Back in 1993, India's GDP was just half the size of the UK. But by 2023, it's estimated that India's economy will be 10% larger. India's rapid economic growth has been driven by three major factors. First, their population is large and relatively young, meaning that there's lots of workers able to fill roles, build products, and provide services. A large portion of those workers contribute to the second driver, which is India's middle class with more Indians than ever having disposable income to spend on goods and services, Indian's economy can start to feed on itself. And finally, the third driver is government policy. Over the last three decades, India has been relatively business friendly, not getting in the way of the growth that's basically been baked into their situation. Meanwhile, in the United Kingdom, manufacturing has nearly disappeared and growth has slowed substantially. And this is paired with an explosion of public and private debt. Since 1993, the national debt has increased from 300 billion pounds to 2.5 trillion, while private debt has increased from 1.2 trillion to 2.7 trillion. Meanwhile, British labor has remained relatively highly paid compared to the rest of the world. Between strong labor unions and a relatively high minimum wage, British brands that rely on domestic talent find themselves increasingly less competitive. Which is a shame, because the United Kingdom has some of the most iconic brands on the planet. Brands take time to develop and embed themselves into culture. But once they're stuck in a population psyche, it can be incredibly hard to get them out. Cadbury was founded in 1824 in Birmingham, England. Johnny Walker was founded in 1820 in Kilmarnock, Scotland. And Rolls-Royce was founded in 1906 in Derby, England. And they all benefited from the peak of the British Empire, where trade moved in both directions. So the okay, so I'll stop there. Just a uh, fun fact: I really don't like Cadbury chocolate. I don't think it's any good. Now I think it's been Cadbury's bought by Mondelez, uh, I believe, and we have Milka here, which I think it's ten times better. 
I'm not sure if Milka also belongs now to Mondelez, but English people love their Cadbury, uh, which I don't understand. I don't think the chocolate is of any quality. And interesting when he said about the middle class <clears throat> in India, because it does feel like here, um, over the last decade, it does feel like there is a push for the middle class uh, to be eradicated somehow. But let's continue. Brits would import diamonds and gold from South Africa, textiles from Hong Kong, and corn and wheat from America. But in return, they'd export Cadbury chocolates, Johnny Walker whiskey, and Rolls-Royce cars around the globe. Today, you can go almost anywhere, and those brands will be recognized and understood. That's prestige, something that India and Tata was lacking. The issue of having the need to grow and the need to take a view that you had grown in India in some cases with a fairly substantial market share, and that as a group, we ought to look beyond the shores of India. As India's wealth had grown, Tata looked to move up the food chain and target brands that mattered internationally and commanded strong margins. Their first move came in 2000. That's when Tata's global beverages division acquired the British tea company, Tetley. Tetley was founded in 1837 in Yorkshire. They were the first company to sell tea in tea bags to the United Kingdom in 1953. By 1990, with a yearly production of more than 20 billion tea bags, they were one of the world's largest tea companies. This move was one of the earliest instances of an Indian company making a high profile acquisition of a British brand. Tata acquired Tetley for $432 million. And the acquisition made Tata the second largest tea company in the world after Unilever, which owns Lipton. The international expansion, though, was not without some controversy. And aside from the economic rationale, there was also emotional consequences. And I'm thinking here of the acquisition of Tetley Tea. Yeah. Uh, the idea of a, a beloved British tea brand being bought by an Indian company must have stirred, stirred some hearts in England. If they did, uh, it was quite quiet and dignified. And despite new ownership, Tetley could still trade on its English heritage. That meant that Tata just bought a ton of market share in the UK, Canada, and the US. Tata could also lower expenses at Tetley. After the acquisition, the company consolidated their operations, reduced the number of employees, closed some factories, and streamlined the supply chain. As a result of these measures, Tetley's expenses were cut by as much as 10%. In 1999, Tetley's revenue was $736 million. Their profit margin was about 10%, meaning that their expenses were about $662 million. That means that Tata was able to find approximately $66 million of additional profit in the company that they acquired. When you consider the $432 million acquisition price, they got back 15% of that cost in the first year just through those savings. It was a smashing success and it whet Tata's appetite for more international expansion. In the mid-2000s, Chorus Steel, Europe's second largest steel producer, was struggling and losing money. Since it was primarily based in the UK and the Netherlands, it faced particularly high operational costs from its labor and regulatory compliance. These high costs were exacerbated as the market for steel became increasingly global, and producers based in countries with lower labor costs and less regulation could price Chorus out of the market. A lack of vertical integration compounded Chorus's issues. Unlike their competitors, Chorus did not control access to the raw materials required for making steel, meaning that fluctuations in the commodity prices associated with key materials like iron ore and coal could sink the company. Tata Steel solved both problems. They purchased Chorus Group in 2007 for $12 billion, a landmark deal for the steel industry and the largest acquisition by an Indian company at the time. Upon taking over, they ran the same playbook. They shut down plants and laid off workers, but they also invested in raw materials assets from Canada and Mozambique to secure their European operations. Back home in India, Tata Steel was already vertically integrated. The company owned iron ore and coal mines in the Indian states of Jharkhand and Odisha, which provided them security mm -hmm. from commodity price fluctuations. Now, thanks to the Chorus acquisition, Tata's cost-competitive steel had distribution networks set up in Europe. 
In short order, Tata became the fifth largest steel producer in the world, but they had one more move to make. The signs were everywhere, but now it's official we are in a recession. 2008 was a tumultuous year for the economy. The housing market collapse created one financial crisis after another. The federal agency that takes over unsound banks is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the same people who guarantee that depositors won't lose their money. Ford was one of the companies most affected by the Great Recession. In 2008, the company lost $14.6 billion. Sales in the United States declined by 20%, and the company's cash reserves dwindled by $21 billion. The only way for Ford to avoid bankruptcy was to take on loads of long-term debt, lay off 30,000 employees, and sell some of its assets. Tata saw the opportunity and pounced. They acquired Jaguar and Land Rover from Ford in a $2.3 billion all-cash, no-stock transaction. It marked Tata Motors' entry into the premium luxury car market, but automotive insiders thought that they were taking a risky gamble. Here's what people were missing. Tata was already a manufacturing partner to Jaguar Land Rover before acquiring the IP in 2008. Back in 2004, Tata Motors had begun to produce Jaguar and Land Rover vehicles under license from Ford. And prior to that, they'd learned to scale manufacturing through producing their own vehicle, the Tata Indica. The faith you put in your people to do this, and case in point was on the Indica, conventional wisdom said that you couldn't enter the car business without having a collaboration. And certainly to think of designing a car domestically and producing it It was an unheard of thing. The Indica was introduced in December 30th of 1998. It was the first passenger hatchback from Tata Motors, which had previously produced station wagons and SUVs. But importantly, the Indica was one of India's first indigenously developed passenger cars. It was Tata's engineers that had developed the design for the vehicle and how to manufacture it. By 2008, they'd produced more than 1.2 million vehicles and hit annual sales numbers as high as 140,000 per year. The car was even exported to other countries, including the United Mm -hmm. Kingdom, South Africa, and Sri Lanka. This feat of manufacturing and engineering gave Tata the confidence to jump into larger car markets. Now, with Jaguar and Land Rover, they had the iconic car brands to make it happen. For the past few years, Ford had been under-investing in these companies as it struggled with cash flow. Immediately, Tata infused substantial funds into Jaguar Land Rover to modernize and expand their production facilities. They also marketed the luxury brands to the growing Indian upper class. In short order, Jaguar Land Rover became profitable, and today it's one of the world's fastest growing luxury car brands. Now, Tata is not alone in turning the tables on its former colonial rulers. Numerous Indian conglomerates have leveraged their relatively low costs of labor and raw materials to improve the margins of British brands that have stalled out over the last three decades. Mahindra Group acquired BSA Motorcycles. Royal Enfield was taken over by the India-based Iker Motors in 1994. India's United Breweries Group purchased Hobson's, a British brewery. But perhaps nothing epitomizes this changing of the guard more than the current Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Rishi Sunak. It's obvious to most that he's of Indian descent. But what less people know is that he is the son-in-law of the founder of another Indian conglomerate, Infosys. His time in office will surely deepen the economic ties between these two countries and open the door for more mergers and acquisitions. We'll be watching how this plays out in the years ahead as it supports our thesis that India is poised to win the 21st century. We made it. So, yeah, I actually agree uh, what he's saying that India is, is to win the 21st century. I think I mentioned that that many times. It's, uh, I, I guess, based on, you know, all everything that we've discussed and all your history and, you know, colonization, etc. This must be feeling really, really nice. I actually, I think I once had a chat with someone in the comments about Tatli, even though I lived in the country for almost two decades, I've never really... <laughs> 
been aware of this brand much. Uh, maybe I have, but I don't really like English tea. So, um, yeah, I it's it's not my thing. So perhaps this is why I have never noticed that. But it was interesting that uh, it was purchased by Tata. And, you know, I see that uh, JLR. It's interesting. Um, I don't know if you are aware. A couple of years uh, back, maybe two or three, I was... Um, with someone and they were discussing cars and he said like uh, you know if you get a JLR car it means it's in service like every every other month that it's not really good or reliable car and you know you always see it and it's portrayed as this luxury car but the person was particularly in the favor of BMWs and their re reliability and it's apparently way better than than JLR but as I said like we also have it planned uh, of that and uh, every time I watch anything about Tata it just makes me feel that you know the uh, the owner is uh, super smart and also you know the I always think about the lawyers uh, like the mergers and acquisition lawyers from the, the biggest hotshot law companies I'm in my head I'm thinking Harvey Specter from the suits uh, and you know because it, it just takes things to uh, to spotty opportunity but also get the deal through uh, I think the opportunity is one thing but getting the deal through might be way harder so they are incredibly smart and must feel very good for you that you know it's it's kind of like paying the karma uh quote goes around comes around in a way sooner or later I, I don't think it's avoidable and um i personally do believe that english are living their karma or starting to live their karma right now um and especially with uh, with rishi sunak i was like heck yeah like he should be the the pm um and uh like, I'm not going to lie, I don't think that many English people are perhaps happy about that. Um, and uh, there were a lot of uh, pieces on him that, you know, he apparently was supposed to come from a poor background, but he currently doesn't, you know, he's married to someone with a lot of money. So um, they believe that, you know, it's not going to advocate the interests, let's say, of a middle class. And I feel like I mentioned that before, uh, the middle class is... is, is kind of vanishing in the West, really, really vanishing, which is something that's growing in India, which is uh, super great. I almost feel like uh, the, the recent events are, are set, uh, designed to, to, to eradicate that group of people so we can only have rich and poor. Uh, but uh, who knows, maybe I'm just like blobbing uh, kind of a nonsense here. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, well done, Tata. Bring bring it on and uh, show what you can do and uh, the way you know they could turn things around just speaks to their intelligence and capability. I think it's a great job. And with that being said, I think this is it for today's video. If you did like it, please give it a thumbs up, share and subscribe to this channel. And I'll see you in the next one. Until then, you take care. Much, much love. Bye-bye.